Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 86 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle, and I am here down in Vomitorium East with my good friend and a co-host, David Noe. How are you doing tonight, Dave? I'm doing real well. I learned something recently. What's that? The place we are recording, this is called Swan Lake. Is it really called Swan Lake? Yes, it really is. Right. Now, we see the cygnets yes. cruising around the water, chasing the geese and so forth. The lake has a name. It's Swan Lake, and it's idyllic, isn't it? It is very nice. Isn't it also, that's like the one ballet name I know. Isn't it like Swan Lake? Isn't it a famous I, ballet? I think it is a famous ballet. Yeah, but I, I would never have known the name of this no. lake or even guessed that it had a name. It has a name. Everything has a name. Yeah. It's like a locus amoinus, I think. It is very much a locus amoinus, right? It's right? too beautiful. Yeah. Something terrible is going to happen in this location, like maybe a podcast. <laughs> How are you feeling tonight, Jeff? I'm feeling good. I had a good week. I um, got to visit Chicago. Oh, yeah. Last week. Uh, my the son, Windy Apple. The Windy <laughs> Apple. My son uh, graduated from eighth grade, and he, he wanted, as his gift, He want, he's always wanted to go to the art museum there. Sweet. And I, had not, I have not been there for probably 20 years. It's a good antiquities collection, if I'm not mistaken. It's not bad. I mean, if you, I mean, if you compare it to... Um, I mean, some other museums around the country. It's, I haven't been to the Met in New York. Have right. You? I, I have not been to the Met either. No. But they have a decent uh, a Greco-Roman collection. But I mean, the, the, just the breadth of the, the stuff there. We we were, my wife and my son and I were in there for about five hours. Incredible. It was it was great. And so my son is an aspiring sculptor, painter. He's just fascinated by art. And He's so the guy that does great. the claymation stuff does too. The claymations. Wow. And all that kind of stuff. So he was absolutely fascinated by by it. And it so was, talent it was runs in the family. Yeah, I'd on like, the mother's side. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is all. All of that to say is that I'm feeling good. I'm feeling yeah. rested and and ready to go. Yeah. All right. Yep. Good. So what are we going to give the people tonight? Well, we're going to carry on our look at Virgil's Aeneid uh, uh, Book Two. Book Two. Remind the audience, uh, this is Dave's favorite. Yes, uh, it is fit part of the Aeneid. And right? in fact, before we get to the shout out, mm-hmm. before we get to the opening quote, yeah, would you like a little anecdote? Yes, give me an anecdote. Would okay, you? Okay. So it was uh, about the year 1994. 596. I'm a young grad student at the University of Iowa, and a visiting scholar by the name of Vasily Rudich came to campus to lecture on the topic of Lucan. Now, Vasily Rudich taught at Yale from 84 to 95. I looked him up a little bit. He's the author of Political Dissidents Under Nero, The Price of Dissimulation. He's also the author of Religious Dissent in the Roman Empire, Violence in Judea, at the time of Nero. Now, okay, yeah. neither of these books have I read, but mm-hmm. I want to now because... He's a fascinating scholar. And here's the anecdote. Yeah. Over supper, as we were talking about Roman poetry generally, he revealed to us, not in a braggadocious way, that he had memorized all of Book 2. Really? Ev- every line of the Latin of Book 2 of the Aeneid. Did you make him prove it? No. <laughs> in hindsight, <laughs> maybe I should have. <laughs> but I was just dumbfounded. Yeah. Because he said, it's, he said it is the most you know, uh, gorgeous piece of Latin poetry, uh, words to this effect, yeah, that, that have ever been written. He also said, this was a shocking claim, he said, if I could have access to Ovid's play, The Medea, mm-hmm. Ovid wrote a tragedy, right? The Medea, yeah. Lost. He said, I would give up 10 years of my life. Really? For, for a chance to read Ovid's Lost wow. Medea. Oh my gosh. And I had to think about that. And I, would I do that? Maybe if I could string together all the times I've watched, you know, A Very Special Blossom... <laughs> Or the different strokes reunion. If I could string all those times together, I'd give that up. (laughs) But I don't want to just lop 10 years off the end. No, no, no. Exactly. If you could kind of... Compress it. If you could corral together all of that that time wasted. Right. Right, exactly. Down when you're getting a new driver's license or something. Yeah. Yeah, I'd I'd happily give up that Sure, sure. To read Ovid's Medea. Right. But I was just so impressed. This is an individual. I'd never heard the name before. A a well-known classicist. This is an individual who really loves this literature. Yeah. Made a big impact on me. That is. So do you think that was instrumental in kind of it, you calling this book also your favorite? Or had you come to that conclusion before then? Um, I think it was, I don't know if it's instrumental. It definitely helped. Yeah. Definitely helped. Yeah. A, a small instrument, you know. Right. Maybe like a, um, you know, eyeglass screwdriver or something. Not, I, <laughs> not like a jackhammer. No, no, no. Not, yeah. Not, not a heavy industrial no, equipment. No, not right? a big <laughs> instrument. But I thought, Wow. 
it's possible to really love uh, Roman poetry and be very dedicated to it. It was an inspiring example. That's amazing. I mean, just the, the just the idea of memorizing right. the entirety of these um, what like nine hundred lines in yes, this book or something. Yes, phenomenal. Phenomenal, right? And I have memorized a little bit of poetry, but nothing like that. No, so. I think we talked. I, I, the uh, my first grad school assignment was to memorize the That's first right. 150 lines of the Iliad. Yes, and then perform them and comment That's incredible. on them. Incredible. It was it was awful. And I quickly flushed it out of my brain once the assignment was done, but I'd never tried to... Yes, but the, the important thing, Jeff, is it led to an episode of Ad Nauseam. It did. Back to the nine things I hated about grad school. I mean, it, was in, it was in there. I think we mentioned something that. Something like that. <laughs> that. So, yeah, if, I, that was sowing the seeds for something very important yes. down the line. Okay, yeah. the shout out. Yeah, who does that go to today? So this goes to a man by the name of Rodney Croom. Rodney Croom is another one from uh, the Pacific region. Or huge there. Yeah, he's from uh, Hobart, Tasmania. I think he's the first Tasmanian that we know of who's listening to the show. It's the first Tasmanian I've ever had any kind of contact interaction with. with? Yeah, right. Now, but Tasmania is an island off the south coast, the of southeast the... coast of the uh, Australian uh, continent. Right. Yes, and so uh, Rodney says uh, regarding the Pacific, because in our in our correspondence, I said words to the effect of. Uh, the Pacific is really well represented in our recent shout outs. And you mentioned it's Oceana. Oceana. Right, right. Yeah. And he said, it's winter here. So oh, yeah. picture snow-capped mountains. Rodney's a poet, apparently. Mm. Picture snow-capped mountains and pedestrians shivering in the rain rather than the palm trees and sun-kissed beaches. I see. So he's they're suffering through winter right now. And, yeah. Right. And uh, But uh, around, the, around the bend in a few months, they'll have the That's power right. back. Yeah. But their suffering is shivering in the rain. Yeah. Ours is shoveling eight feet of snow. <laughs> so not a lot of sympathy for me. But no, no, Rodney, no. thank you so much yeah. for listening to the podcast. That's great. Yeah. And for the kind words you yes. sent along. Yeah. That's wonderful. And uh, for contacting us. And uh, we're really appreciative of yes. that. Yes. Thank you, Rodney. And Jeff, I believe you have the opening quote for us tonight. Here's a opening you like it. Yes. So um, as I was uh, reading the rest of book two in preparation for this, um, I was reminded of this is, I don't know if I would say it's one of my favorite scenes because it's so dark, mm-hmm. but one of the most powerful pieces of literature that I have ever encountered in, in, in Greek or in Latin is the death of Priam. Right. And it, it's, it's, I think it's in some ways it is the, the lowest point in um in in this book now before you read the quote yeah can, can i ask can you summarize as succinctly as possible what is it about priam's death that moves you it's one detail and i remember it when i read this for the first time in um as an undergraduate um it's when priam is uh being killed and he uh, virgil gives the detail that he slips in the blood of his own son mm. it's and I, he, he's, he's just seen and we'll talk about this he's just seen his his own son murdered in front of him and then one of his last physical acts is to slip in the blood of his son. And I, I just, I, that just gives me chills. It's, uh, it's so horrifying. Hmm. Um, but it's so darkly beautiful yeah. too, in, some, in some way. Yeah. The one thing that struck me was that uh, Priam suited up before uh, Neoptolemus, Pyrrhus, yeah. approached. He pulled down some old weaponry from the walls right. and puts it on, you know, like an old combat veteran saying, well, I know I'm feeble and this is going to be ineffective, but I have to make do. And his wife mocks him at that point. Yeah. Right. Hecuba yeah. mocks him. And so it's such a picture of of courage in the face of, um, you know, such feebleness. Yes. And, and it's, it's pathetic in, in, it in, in, the, in the root meaning of Correct. that word. Correct. The right? strong pathos. I found yeah. that very moving as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a brutal scene front to back. Yeah. Yeah. So the opening quote. The opening quote. This is from an article called The Death of Priam uh, by one Robert Sklenar. And this goes back to 1990 from the journal Hermes. He writes, The death of Priam is indisputably one of the great Virgilian set pieces, but Virgilian criticism has so far served it poorly, according it more reverence than attention. One of the few discussions that treat the Priam episode, most tend to, or of the few discussions that treat the Priam episode, most tend to exhaust themselves in a chaotic search for a single unifying problem, which once confronted might surrender the scene's entire wealth of meaning. Although Richard Hines was right to observe that Priam's death replicates the fall of Troy, the symbolism that identifies Priam as the corporeal expression of his kingdom invites further questions about the significance of Neoptolemus as Priam's foil, of Aeneas as narrator, of Hecuba, of the scene's poetic structure. So, so I can just interrupt here a little yep. bit. I'm getting lost a little bit in the, the heavy academic prose. Yeah. Can you ex- explain a little bit what, what this means here? Richard Hines 
Uh, Priam's death replicates the fall of Troy. Yes. And the symbolism, the, the, the three parts there. Mm-hmm. So I think what he's saying is that he's saying in the, the broadest sense, uh, critics have, have treated this scene with reverence. Okay. And it's, it's almost like it's untouchable. Okay. Heinz went further and said, no, the, the, the Priam's death, it kind of represents the, it's the final nail in the coffin for Troy. Okay. And what Sklenar is saying, he says, we need to even look even closer. It's not just about Priam's death. It's about Neoptolemus's role and uh, kind of the echoes of meaning and and symbolism there. It's okay. We, so, so Aeneas is is narrating. He's watching this. All right. His, his wife is there. So okay. there's all these different perspectives. So Neoptolemus or Pyrrhus, mm-hmm. the son of Achilles. Yes. And the one who succeeds in slaughtering Priam. Yes. All right. So that's clear. Then the next part, Aeneas as narrator. Aeneas as narrator. Right. What's it? What does this mean? Well, I think he he's um, what Sklenar goes on in the article to kind of um, to explore is that we're not getting this scene as um it's not a third person narrator it's an om- it's not an omniscient poet telling us the story it's, mm. it's, it's aeneas is telling the story to dido but he's not telling he's telling it because he watched this before right. his very eyes and that adds kind of again another layer of pathos there that he's saying most critics ignore huh. yep so it's like being an observer in the theater yes he's a front row seat front row seat right and he's and he's um uh, almost uh well, we can talk about this, but it seems like he's almost frozen. He's he's helpless. Yes. Uh, he can't do anything about this. Like seeing something in a dream. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And the third part, um, the significance of Hecuba. I'm not sure what, what Sklenar is, is getting at. I mean, I read the article a couple of days ago. I, it didn't strike me as that was a huge part of his argument. But, um, I mean, his wife also as an attendant to the, the horrors here. Um, I think largely what he's saying is that to fully kind of appreciate the scene, it, you, you can't just focus on Prime. You have to get, focus on all these other people involved in the scene, watching the scene okay. to kind of get the layers of its meaning. Okay. And I interrupted you, but can you read just the last quote of the opening quote? Because it's nice. Yeah. So he says, all of these things are not isolated matters, but part of a thematic intarsia. Oh, there you go. Yeah. No. Intarsia. Intar- is, that, is that how you say it? Yeah. I think it's intarsia. Intarsia, kind of the, the layer, the inlaid nature of it, right? Yeah. Intarsia and in Jane. So. In- <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, intarsia, whose elaborate beauty still awaits full appreciation. Yeah. So an intarsia is um, you, you've got a, a, a flat piece of wood. Yeah. And you um, you sculpt out of it. You know, you you make a substrate and you make a pattern. It's like a parquet floor, yeah. but in an object of furniture. Right. It's something I've never done, but always wanted to do. It make, looks looks difficult. Yes. And when done well, it's it's it can be stunning. It's a lot of sanding, a lot of coping saw. Right. Very careful fitting. Right. It makes me think of the um the fo- the floor at the Boston Garden that mm. the Celtics play on. Right. The parquet floor is yes. is full of in in, in tarja. I didn't know that. Yes. Yes. Have you been watching the NBA finals? No, I haven't watched the NBA in probably about twenty years. But, oh, okay. But uh, I know about ever the since floor. you retired from the game. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so that's Robert Sklenar. Yep. And uh, the death of Priam. The death of Priam. So I don't know in in the intervening thirty plus years if if um, in his uh, estimation. Uh, people have fully appreciated him, but maybe Mr. Sklenar thinks that he's the only one who fully appreciates this scene. <laughs> I doubt that. But we're going to try tonight. Yes. We're going to try tonight to advance the audience's appreciation for this great scene, yep. the death of Priam. And others. So what are we giving the people? Well, we're going to, well, we'll do our best. We, we uh, Whenever we make promises about what we're going to cover, we always they break we, them. We break them all the time. Right. We'll but, cover 400 lines. Right. Three lines later, <laughs> it's the end of the program. We're going to do our best to get to the end of okay. book two. Um, but no promises, because there's so many incredible set pieces. The, uh, we're going to start with the death of Laocoon. We've got um, the uh, the storming of the Citadel in right. Priam's Palace, the death of Priam, of course, the um, the dragging away of Cassandra. Right. There's all kinds of, of, of horrible and wonderful things happening. The almost death of Helen. The almost death of Helen. Right. Right. And we have one avid audience member uh, whose initials are RM, mm-hmm. who's always telling us, hey, slow down. Let me nerd out on the material. Right. Don't, uh, you know, don't go too fast. But, of course, we can't just please him. No. But are, you, are you suggesting that we should kind of walk down uh, Mr. M's path tonight? or? Well, yeah. I think we should, you know... Um, we should take our time. Okay. This yeah. this great literature is not going to appreciate itself. That's right. You know, <laughs> that, that, you're right. There's no need to rush. No. Right. For the sake of of, of getting through it. So we're right. picking up in book two. Yes. We're at the uh, appearance of Hector to Aeneas. Is that where we're we're, we're starting out here? Yeah. Do, we did not get to that last time, did okay. we? Right. So um, we finished up the actor Sinon. Yes. Right. Um, who's involved in the elaborate ruse to right. get the horse into the city? Right. Um, and then uh, so Aeneas spends a lot of this book uh, kind of on the knife edge of indecision or he doesn't know what to do running hither and yon in a in a darkened city right what really struck me about this this book is that um it seems to clear to me that aeneas in telling his own story it wasn't necessarily obvious to him that 
I'm in charge now. Oh, right, I you know, see. so like, like he's 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 necessarily going to be the heir apparent. I mean, Hector is dead, right? Hector appears to him, um, but Priam is still alive when um, when Hector appears to him. So it's this uh, this this idea that you know Aeneas isn't kind of saying, "Yes, I'm in command. I'm going to lead the the refugees right. out." But he has leadership thrust upon him. Right. So this question of leadership with Aeneas uh, takes us back to the Iliad, actually. Okay. And I think this is what uh, Virgil is picking up on psychologically. So book 13 of the Iliad, this is uh, Johnston's translation, uh, we're interest, introduced to Deophobus, mm -hmm. one of Priam's sons. As he thought about his options, as Deophobus thought about his options, he thought his best plan was to find Aeneas. He met Aeneas standing at the back among the crowd, for Aeneas, who excelled among the warriors, always resented Priam, for not showing him enough respect. Oh. So you've got you've got the whole plot right there, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, so yeah. Virgil, as a very careful reader of Homer, probably had much of Homer memorized, frankly. Right. He picks up on that, right? So there's the psychology of Aeneas' motivation. I'm as good as any of these Trojans, even Hector, but I never get any respect. Right. He's the Rodney Dangerfield of the Trojans. <laughs> That's so interesting. I love that detail. And so, you know, in book two, you know, he he's told you know, his destiny twice. Right. You know, right. Hector tells him in this in this ghostly appearance. Right. And then his wife at the very end says this to him. And so it's uh it has he has to have two people kind of tell him, It's you. Yes, to prod him and goad him along. Yeah. Because uh the resentment alone wasn't enough. He needs some external motivation. It strikes me as almost biblical, right? Is it that you know oh, yeah. Aeneas is kind of the unlikely Right. Here, he, he's like he's a Gideon, he's a David. Or a Jacob even. Right. right. Oh yeah, yeah, right. The, the second born who's a you know um, a trickster and not not really born to the role of you know founder of the people. Yeah, but he's eventually brought there. Yeah, through yeah. a series of you know providential arrangements. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah, that's great stuff. Hmm. Should we uh, should we talk about the death of Leo? We have to. We have to. Right. <laughs> so right after Sinon finishes his his tale. Um, you remember Leokoan, the, the priest, he's the one who says, you know, I don't, uh, you know, I, I fear, I fear Greeks, uh, even when they're, when they're bringing gifts. That's right. He throws this spear that lodges in the side of the, the, uh, the Trojan horse and kind of sits there, uh, uh, you know, kind of wavering. Um, and then, uh, after Sinon finishes his kind of his long dramatic tale, uh, we see Leokoan, he's at an altar and he's sacrificing a great bull to Neptune. Yes. And, um, suddenly these two great serpents come coiling out of the sea. From the direction of Tenedos, the island where um, Virgil has told us that, that, that where the Greeks are hiding. Mm. And they come onto the shore and they snatch up Laocoon and his two sons and um, drag them to their watery deaths. Yeah, and wolf them down. Right. A, a short, meaningless anecdote here. Do you know, uh, uh, you know the band R.E.M.? Yes. Are you a, a fan or no? No. No? Okay. <laughs> no. I yeah. kind of like the... Uh, I haven't listened to them in years. I kind of like the sound a yeah. little bit that the band makes, but I don't really like that style of music, and I can't stand the vocals. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Mike, Michael Stipe, right, is yes. the singer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just find his voice so whiny. I can, I can understand that. There's right? no, there's no timbre, no richness. Gotcha. Well, I am a fan. I figured. And, ba and back, <laughs> and back, the, back in the day um, when I was in college, I was, I was a massive fan. Oh, really? And one of the things I liked about Michael, Michael Stipe, I mean, he's a, he's an oddball, and he writes odd lyrics. And yes. I, I kind of like that. Okay. Um, but he'll often throw in these classical references he talks about the furies and and uh, makes homeric references here and there and there's a song off the uh, their album murmur it goes back to 1982 or so great mm. album and it's a song called laughing and the opening line is he sings um la Guan and her two sons and then it kind of kind of guys it goes into kind of meaningless kind of jibber jabber and stuff. okay but that line has always struck me you know being a classicist I thought, you know, what's he talking about there and why is it her two sons right, right? And so it, the the song has always kind of mystified me. So you traveled to where Stipe lives, in Georgia, or down somewhere? to Athens, Georgia, to, kind of, and, to and ask him, knock down his door. Excuse me, Mister Stipe, <laughs> what's the deal with her two sons? <laughs> I did the lazy approach to the same idea was I checked the internet occasionally if if he had been interviewed about this song because I was kind of curious what was he thinking. Right? right. I finally found an interview okay, where somebody asked it. him and said, you know, who is this, this Laaka one? And he said, oh yeah, is this uh, this priest who gets. Um, who gets killed by these two serpents? It's a, it's a great story. Um, and the interview has about a priest, so it's a he. And he goes, uh, "Yeah, I just changed the gender for the fun of it." <laughs> so I had always been thinking like he had meant something kind of you know deep and meaningful yeah. and interesting there, but no, no, he was just kind of 
goofing. Yeah, right. Interesting. So I waited, you know, twenty five years to find that. Out. <laughs> Worth the wait? Uh, I'd say it was a little bit of a letdown. Are they producing any more? You know, I'm using scare quotes here. Yeah. Music. <laughs> uh, REM disbanded about uh, eight years ago. Oh, what a shame! They came. Yes, they came to a decision, a mutual decision, that it was time to step away. Okay. Right. right. So back to the death of Laocoon. <laughs> yes. All right. You want to? You want to read us some Latin here? Yes. You want me to start at two o nine? Two o nine. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Fit sanatus spumanta salo yam quarwatan ebant, ardentis quacolo sufecti sanguinet igni, sibila lambe bant linguis vibrantibus ordra, di fugimus vi sex sangue silagmina certo, la ocoante petunt et primum parvo du ordrum, corpora nator rum serpens amplexus uterque, implicate et miserros morsu de pascatur artus. Wonderful. Right, oh, and bloody, very bloody, violent. Right, and I remember my uh, my Latin prof when I first read this, kind of pointed out all the S sounds. Yes, right? the sibilance, it's right? The sibilance, yes. Sonatus spumanti salo. Right, it's supposed to put us in mind of the snakes. Yeah, it's wonderful. Here's Lombardo's translation of that. They were almost ashore. Their eyes, they being the serpents, their eyes were shot with blood and fire. Their tongues hissed and flickered in their open mouths. We scattered, pale with fear, as the sea snakes glided through the sand straight for Laocoon. First they entwined the priest's two sons in great looping spirals, and then they sank their fangs into the boys' wretched bodies and began to feed. <laughs> oh, isn't that awful? <laughs> I'm cowering over here. Cowering. It was just a little bit more kind of beyond the Latin, yeah. which you read. Uh, then they seized Laelkawan as he ran to their aid, weapon in hand, and lashed their scaly bodies twice around his waist and twice around his neck. Their heads reared high. Ooh, <laughs> that brutal. Yeah, that's great. Right. Yeah. So I, again, the 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 ironies and the reversals here. It, you can see why it would be easy for the Trojans to think they the gods just punished him right for throwing the spear into the side of the horse. That's right. And so they would they would conclude then. Therefore, we should accept this gift. Correct. And immediately after the snakes do their damage, they they uh, they slink off and they shelter. Um, at the shrine of Minerva. Yeah, oh, that's the, right. At the foot of the statue. Yeah. So it's more divine providence, right? The gods are trying to tell us something. Yes, 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 right. yes. Yeah, and um, it's and it's just from, uh, um, you know, the bird's eye view that we have, it's just so cringing that we see the Trojans right. just kind of taking these steps towards their own doom. Yeah, they're so duped. It's providential misdirection. Yep. So now we get to talk about the statue group. Yeah, this is one of my favorites of all time. I think I've seen it, I think, four four times, maybe five. I'm about the same for me, yeah. but it's one of those that you could stand in front of for a very long time and just in taking all of the, right. the nuances. It's a disturbing statue. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, let me read from this uh, esteemed scholarly source, uh, uh, Mr. W.I. Kapedia. Oh, yeah. Oh, you yes. know W. Kapedia? Oh, is that untouchable. That's right. Yeah. The statue of Laocoon and his sons, also called the Laocoon Group, the Italian Gruppo de Laocoon de... <laughs> Has been one of the most famous ancient sculptures ever since it was excavated in Rome in 1506. Hmm, who was in Rome in 1506? 1506. Hmm. That's, hmm. Michelangelo Buonarroti? Oh, that guy. That Ra- guy. Raphael too. Yeah. Yes, and it was placed on public display in the Vatican Museums where it remains. It is very likely the same statue that was praised in the highest terms by the main Roman writer on art, Pliny the Elder, hmm. or Pliny, as Dennis Miller calls him. Pliny. The figures are near life size, and the group is a little over six feet in height, showing the serpent, sorry, the Trojan priest Laocoon and his sons. Did you know they have names? I didn't know this. Yes, this is not from Virgil, but elsewhere. Antiphantes and Thimbrius being attacked by sea serpents. Those poor guys, it's the only thing they're, they're famous for. That's right. Being strangled by snakes. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of a... Uh, I'm trying to think of an analog of someone who's famous for just one, one really bad one, thing. Uh, I, I, have you heard of um, the um, the little person Eddie Goodell? No. Who uh, the um, the promoter of the White Sox? Okay. Um, was was famous for his gags. Okay. Um, he sent in this 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 little person, like three foot five guy. Okay. Uh, up to bat with a plastic bat. Uh, um, because he knew that the, his strike zone would be so small that he would get a walk. Right. And he got the walk, and he went to first base and got a pinch runner. It's the only thing that guy huh. was ever known for. Or how about the guy that, um, you're a baseball fan, so the guy in Wrigley Field who interrupted, interfered with the catching oh, of the foul ball. Steve Bartman. Is that his name? Yes, that poor sap. Yeah, that's the one thing he did, and he cost the, the uh, Cubs the World Series, right? Uh, p- potentially, yes. Okay. Right, yes. Um Oh, one of the big... Poor guy. The poor guy had to go into hiding. Yeah. Yeah. Because he was so hated. Yeah. Or maybe the Dutch kid who stuck his finger in the dike. 
Oh, what was his name? I don't know. Hans, probably. Hans Van something, probably. <laughs> so that's <laughs> that's what we got here. That's yeah. Antifondis and Tim Bryas. Right. But the really interesting thing about this story, and you know, maybe we'll dedicate a gurgle to it. Yeah. Is that Michelangelo was in Rome at the time, uh, working for the Pope uh, Julius, if mm-hmm. I'm not mistaken, and uh, so he was called in right away when this thing was dug up, and you know, what do you think of this? And he immediately recognized this is a Hellenistic masterpiece. Yes. This is phenomenal, and. Uh, Laocoon, writhing in pain there between his sons, uh, was used by Michelangelo as the model for the painting of Christ in the Last Judgment, which is inside the Sistine Chapel. Right, right. On Sitting the, on that throne. On the altar on the altar wall, right? That's correct. Of, he's, he's lifting up the righteous with his right hand and he's... he's uh, Pushing down the... The damned with his left. That's right. Yeah. This um, was the inspiration, the, the musculature on the torso... It's really a phenomenal statue. It is, and it's and it's in that that goriest of Hellenistic style, right? Yes. Where it kind of it, ultra realistic, it, ultra realistic detail for deal, detail's sake. And so, you know, uh, Laocoon's head is twisted back in agony. Right. His sons are looking kind of pathetically to their father for for help that he cannot right. give. Uh, it's, so, if it's you have yeah. if you have an extra five hundred dollars lying around, buy a ticket to Rome. <laughs> Go to Rome, you know, you can have the breakfast at the hotel, but make sure you get to the Vatican Museum. Absolutely. Skip the line and go see this and then fly home. It's worth, worth it's, the it's flight. It's worth it. And I think in that same courtyard, the Apollo Belvedere is That's right, right. right across the way there, too. So it's yeah, just, it's breathtaking. It's, yeah. All right. So he's gone. That's it. He's gone. He's dead. Yep. The Trojans uh, misinterpret the scene. That's right. And uh, the next part of the uh, the next stage of the wheel will turn. And they, and they drag the horse into the city now. I love this detail a lot because I think it shows exactly how clever the Greeks were. In order to get the horse inside the city, what did they have to do to the walls? They had to take them apart. That's right. Yeah. So you know what happened. This is the Krizak translation, uh, line 235. We broke the city open then, laid ramparts bare, preparing for the work. Hooves rolled beneath that mare. On wheels and hemp reins roped her neck, machine of doom. She climbed the city streets with weapons in her womb. Hmm. That's pretty good. So Not bad. the horse was approximately, I don't know, I like to think of it as the horse is, you know, about 12 inches wider than the largest gate. Yeah. You know that Odysseus had to stand there looking at the walls thinking, yeah, I think it's about, you know, it's maybe 14 and a half. Let's make the horse 16 feet. Yes. So they have to take, they have to undo the walls to get the horse in. It's brilliant. It's brilliant, exactly. You ever moved a couch to the second, you know, second floor of some uh, apartment of a friend or your own place? Oh, it's brutal. It is brutal. Yeah, the it's, geometry involved. It's is, incredible. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to think that the people who make those couches, you know, they look at the front door and they think, hey, let's just make it about 12 inches wider. <laughs> Than the door, so nobody can possibly <laughs> nobody could possibly do it right? without breaking their back. Right, you know, it takes five guys to turn that couch around, and yeah. So this is what the Greeks did. It did. It, it's another kind of uh, incredible small little detail. That's to right this, to this this plan. Right. right. So the horse is in the city, and yeah. all havoc breaks loose. Right. So after dark, the um, the Trojans have gone to sleep. They think everything's done. Um, celebrations uh, are in order, um, but uh, in the deep. Uh, depth of the night, the the Greeks drop from the horse. That's right. Um, Ulysses and a number of others are named by Aeneas there. Right. And they open up the gates, and then all the Greeks that had been waiting um, off the island of Tenedos are ready to storm the place. That's right. Now, we don't really get the description here of Helen's involvement. We have to go back to the Odyssey. Right. Book four, how Helen approached the the horse and imitated the voices of the men's wives yeah how she knew they were in there and how she could do all their voices helen is like the rich little of uh, antiquity you know, right with the endless impersonations uh, she, she she's lying okay i think she's completely lying and then you know i think and uh, menelaus kind of corrects her in that in that scene but she presents herself oh, she's lying to pretend she's on the side of the yes well she, she's i mean i think she's lying well, i think for a number of reasons but i think uh, i think homer's also trying to kind of present her as a kind of sorceress okay as well yeah but um, yeah, uh, Aeneas does not mention that particular detail. No, no. Um, You're le- going to read some of the uh, Lombardo here about this event. Yeah, Lombardo translates: the sky turned and night swept up from ocean, enfolding in its great shadow earth and heaven, and the Myrmidons' treachery. The Trojans spread out along the wall, were dead silent now. Dead silent now, slumber entwining their weary limbs, and the Argive fleet started to sail from Tenedos through the silent, complicit moonlight. Making for, shore, making for the shore, they knew all too well. The flagship raised a beacon, and at this signal, Sinon, cloaked by the gods' unjust decrees, stealthily unlocked the pine trap door, 
and the horse released from its open wound, womb the enclosed Danines, glad to push themselves out of the hollow oak into the cool night air, the Sandrus and Stenilus and grim Ulysses sliding down the rope, Achamus and Thoas, Achilles' son, Neoptolemus, great Machaon, Menelaus, and Epios himself, the fabricator of the insidious horse. They fanned out through a city drowned in sleep, slit the guards' throats, opened all the gates, and joined, as planned, the invading Greeks. Mm. That's another just beautiful passage. I mean, it's, it's Lombardo's poetry he here. He did a good it's, job. It's a beautiful passage. Oh, it's it's sublime in the original, but it's quite good in this English, I'd have to say. Yeah. So what do you think? Are there laws that govern war, and rightly so? Is this fair? Is this cowardice? Is this treachery? If you're Aeneas, are you upset not just because your city is falling, but, you know, because they're cheating? I think there's something to that. I mean, we've talked in I think the last couple of episodes about um, kind of this Roman view of deceit as kind of an inherent immor um, Im immoral action, right? right? And so I think, I, I mean, I hear it in kind of Aeneas' description. Like, you know, he, he, he mentions Epios. I mean, the guy that even made the horse is coming out of it, right? And so he's kind of, I think he's disgusted by the trick, but also in kind of embarrassed okay. that the Trojans have fallen for it. Um, and then we'll, t we'll talk about in a little bit, you know, when the, the Trojans themselves try some deceit on trying to escape from the city, trying to fight in the city, it completely backfires on them. Right. And so it's, I just think that, you know, the, the Trojan view of things is, is it's noble, but it's a bit naive. Yeah, it's Roman, of course. It's Roman, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it, um, it, it's noble, but that nobleness comes with kind of an inability, with a, um, a tendency to be outwitted. Yeah. Yeah. So why don't you meet us on the open field of battle? You know, why not uh, meet man to man? Let's have an actual fight, not this sneaking and skulking around snake-like. Right. I think Ulysses would say, we tried that for 10 years. Right. Time for something new. Yeah. Right? But he has no morals. Ulysses has no scruples. No. Uh, he loves his wife, but he'll do anything for a victory. Right. I think there's also this sense that, you know, so Achilles has died at this point. You know, he's he's, he's gone. And... um. I mean, there's a, a strong... You don't, mean, you don't mean Achilles, do you? Achilles is dead. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Ach Achilles is... He dies before the, the horse, right? He okay. dies in the plains. And so I think there's definitely this sense that Ulysses, Odysseus, um, picks up the mantle. Okay. Says, now I'm in charge. We, we tried Achilles' way for 10 years. We went now, with, now we're going to do it my way. Right. We went with uh, brawn. Now we're going to go with brains. We're going to go with brains. Mm -hmm. That's right. Well, um, before we get uh, further into the city, into the into the the horrors of this, should we break for the ads, Dave? Is it about that time? I think we need to have some incongruous sort of statement here, like we've made in the past. Okay. Like speaking of grizzly, yeah, right? it's okay. time for the ads. Do you have one at the ready? No. no. <laughs> so just say a little bit more, and something will come to me. Okay. What All about right. what about the dangers of deceit? Yeah. Before we get into that, it, yes. it, it reminded me of that. Uh, um, I think Virgil's such a great poet. That um, the the Greeks arriving from Tenedos are, I think we're supposed to see them as kind of, it's they're like the serpents. Ah. So the serpents that came to get Laocoon, and now the Greeks are coming for everybody. So again, Laocoon is kind of a stand-in for Troy, right? And so they're arriving, you know, coiling in from the same yes. place to do something on a grander scale, right? So last week we had four mooing. Yes, <laughs> this could be like four snaking. Exactly. Okay. Yes, four snaking. And okay. speaking of four snaking, it's yeah. time for the ads. Let's do it. This episode of Ad Nauseam is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Ratio Coffee, uh, Mark Helwig and his crack team of coffee experts, they've done it. Um, they have created these wonderful machines that can sit on your countertop and shame every other appliance in your house. They're beautiful works of art, and they produce tremendous cups of coffee. That's right. Morning after morning. That's right. Yeah. yeah, Mark asked himself a simple question. Given all the advances in brew technology in... Uh, coffee shops and so forth. How come the home coffee maker has been trapped in the dark ages? Yeah. 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 You know, I, I was, when we were first talking about getting them as a, as a, as a sponsor or seeking them out and thinking about kind of the history of coffee, you would think that I remember, you know, back in the nineties and when you know, the kind of Seattle culture was in, it seemed like, hasn't that been done to death? You know, right. you know, a coffee shop in every corner, you know, right. Blar, Blar blocks and, and all those, all those guys. <laughs> Bar stucks. Bar stucks. Right. But you know, Halloween's uh, genius was, Let's bring it into the home. That's right. Take it off the street corner. Really high quality. Yeah. Now you you've upgraded to the eight recently. I have, yeah. tell, tell us about that experience. Very happy with it. it it's a it's a beautiful machine. Um, the carafe is this 
hand blown glass work of art. Borosilicate. Borosilicate. Not yeah. just boro, not just silicate. Borosilicate. Both of those together. That's right. Right. Yeah, I just love the way it pours. It's such an elegant machine. It is. Right. I, I feel like I'm not good enough for it. <laughs> <laughs> I wish my washing machine could live up to that kind of standard. <laughs> I mean, what an ugly piece of junk yeah. sitting there, you know? Yeah. What is the washing machine? Maybe Mark should get on that, you know, the ratio 25 washing machine. Yeah. Because he'd make it look beautiful, he like would. this coffee machine. Exactly. My, so my ratio, it sits like right above my dishwasher. Okay. And the dishwasher just looks sad and <laughs> grumpy and unwashed. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's how it goes. But you've, you've got uh, you got some walnut accents? Walnut accents, uh, the, the stainless steel finish, oh, perfect. Uh, and the glass borosilicate carafe. It's now, now, which wonderful. of your children is going to inherit this when, when you pass on to glory? Oh, this this will be in my casket with me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's say the uh, the audience wants to get uh, wants to get some of this coffee action. Yeah, what, what do they need to do? Well, they got they got to go to ratiocoffee.com, r e t i o coffee.com, and they can select either the six or the eight, whatever is you know whatever your vibe. That's man. right, <laughs> um, whatever is your vibe, man. <laughs> and if. 15%? 15% off. Don't they have to enter a coupon code? Yes, they have to enter in ANCO89, uh, which will be a code good until the end of this month. That's right, until June, June 30. June 30. And you'll get 15% off um, one of these, or both if you want, these, these great machines. Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseum is also brought to you by Hackett Publishing. H-A-C-K-E-T-T. Hackett Publishing, who have been with us from the very beginning of this little podcast, have supported the classics. They have refused to let the classics be canceled or pushed back onto the shelf. They've said, no, we're going to support the classics, and we're going to publish some fantastic works to help you in your study of the classics. Jeff, yep. without mentioning the covers. Oh, I can't mention the covers no, this time. No, which yeah. we know you love. Yes. The Euripides, Bacchae, I'll mention them the moon landing on the uh, the odyssey mm-hmm. and the normandy for the iliad and the vietnam war memorial for the aeneid yeah can't do any of that jeff you can't what do you like about hackett <laughs> uh i'll say, I'll say uh, affordable all right right i think you'd be hard pressed to find um uh a, a collection of the, these kinds of works at a, at a better price yes but usually affordable means junk like yeah. if you buy the generic peanut butter there's real chalk mixed in <laughs> Right, exactly. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, vitamin K. Right. <laughs> and the Cheerios, you know. Yeah. They're, they're like a cardboard O's if you buy the generic kind. <laughs> right, right, right. So that's what you were getting with Hackett, no, right? Not Because affordable means trash? No, no, no. They, they, they found a way to kind of thread this needle that affordable um, doesn't nec- doesn't have to mean that. It can mean you can get a high quality translation okay. at a very agreeable, affordable price. But only one translator... F- Per major work. No, right? no, no, no. I mean, that's where again, hack it kind of be you know, uh, like the like the gates of Troy, wide open, um, although in a happy kind of way. <laughs> um, lots of bringing literary destruction into your home. <laughs> that's right, right. So, no, many different trans- translators for for the same work. You can choose. You can pick and choose what you what you want to read. So even in this podcast, we're we're, we're using Lombardo's translation, and the other one is what Krizak Krizak's translation for Ovid. You've got Lombardo yep. and the Ambrose translation. Mm-hmm. They have multiple copies of uh, Plato's Republic by different translators, the new Aristotle series. All right, so let's get let's cut to the chase yep. here. The listener wants to get some high quality, affordable uh, translations of the classics yep. and other works. What are they going to do? They're going to go to hackettpublishing.com. They're going to search through their wonderful, amazing catalog, find the works they want, put them in their little satchel, and type in the, the coupon code AN2022. And that will get them two wonderful things, 20% off your order and free shipping. That's incredible. Check it out. This episode of Ad Nauseum also brought to you by Pop City Popcorn, our newest, uh, our latest and greatest, not greatest, but um, a wonderful sponsor. <laughs> They're uh, pretty great. They're pretty great. Of all the popcorn that we promote on this podcast, it's, this it's is the, by far the best. By far the best, right. Uh, Dave, what do you like uh, from their, their selections? Well, my family, we're popcorn people. You, you are? Know? We always have been popcorn people. That's right. And uh, I just love the fact that they have such delicious popcorn. Uh, in fact, uh, Mrs. Noe was talking about one of the cheddar varieties tonight that they have. Maybe it's bacon cheddar, maybe just the regular cheddar. Mm-hmm. There's no cellulose, no no powders, nothing artificial or nonsensey that is, um, is is put into the popcorn mix. No, it's the real deal. It is. Yep. And so I love that bacon cheddar. That's really excellent. And and I'm more of a savory than a sweet guy. Yeah. Uh, but some of their sweet popcorn varieties also excellent, like the butter rum. The butter rum and um, the the two way drizzle. Yeah. That, that's what my 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 boys, you know, kind of you know, sugar aholics. Oh, of love. course, right. I'm more of a savory guy too. You, you've been feeding them Twizzlers, right? So yeah, exactly, nonstop, <laughs> exactly. 
Um, but I love the the Parmesans too. Yeah. And I always consider myself kind of a popcorn purist. Just give me yeah. some little salt, maybe a little bit of butter. But right. this has kind of opened my eyes to a new world. That's right. right. So if you want to uh, enjoy the AN life, like we like to describe, you're drinking great coffee, mm-hmm. you're, you're reading great literature, and you're eating great popcorn. Yes. What does the uh, listener need to do? They need to go to popcitypopcorn.com. Um, you pick out the varieties that you that you love, and uh, in the coupon box, you write, you type in A N POP A N P O P twenty A N P O P twenty. Yes, it's A N POP twenty. A N POP twenty. Let's get this. Now, this is a local concern, isn't it? This is from Kalamazoo. Kalamazoo, just down the road, a fur piece. That's right. Yep. And they've been popping this great popcorn. A family owned business. I think it's our first. Uh, it's our first Michigan-based sponsor, isn't it? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so we'd it, love it if you, if, if, uh, you give them a shot, uh, right. order some popcorn. If in. you're enjoying this podcast, uh, we'd be very, very appreciative if you send them a little business. A-N Pop 20. What's the website again? It's pop, popcitypopcorn.com, and it'll get them 20% off their first order. Excellent. All right, Jeff. So as we get back into it, we are almost to the point of uh, Priam's death. We are. Okay. Right. So let's talk a little bit about the dangers of deceit. Right. So we were, as we were talking about how um, you know, this, this kind of very Roman idea that it's better to meet on the open battlefield than right. to kind of use trickery. Um, I, it's, it's fascinating that the, the Trojans themselves, you know, in their panic, you know, as they're, they're waking up and, you know, hearing the clash of battle and seeing right. the flames, um, they're just try, trying to decide what to do. Right. And so some of these Trojans get together and they decide... Um, the only way we're going to be able to maybe get out of here is just is to disguise ourselves as right. Greeks. Have you ever um, been woken out of a very sound sleep yes. by a, a noise or by a family member? It's ho- it's horrible. It is. Yeah. yeah, I woke up a family member recently uh, so that they could get to a you know an appointment on time, and I knew that this person was going to react strongly because <laughs> there but there was no alternative, right? Yeah. So I said, so and so, wake up, and the person just leapt out of bed. <laughs> terrified you yes. know and i said it's okay it's okay everything's gonna be fine don't worry but i have experienced that myself mm-hmm. it's a, an excruciatingly uncomfortable feeling yes it is and it's it you it's also it's magnified i remember a few nights ago uh, a broom that was just standing up against the wall kind of slid off and hit the ground Oof. and it the sound, as I heard, as I woke up, it was this this um, cacophony, right? Like, whoa, somebody breaking into the house, right? Like a slap or a shot. But it was just a broom falling over. So it's you know everything is kind of amped up too. That's correct because yeah. your senses are so lulled, mm-hmm. and the environment is generally quiet, and yeah. then something punctures that environment. So jarring. Yes. Yeah. So this is what happened to. This is where I'm going. This yeah. is what happened to the Trojans that night. Right. So um, uh, a few of them decide to, you know, they, they find some, you know armor scattered about from Greeks that have That's already right. been killed. Let's disguise ourselves as, as Greeks. Let's go Moto Greco, right? Exactly right, right. And so here the Trojans in a small way are kind of trying they're trying their hand at the Greek way of doing things. And I find it so interesting is that Aeneas tells us it's um it, it backfires. So one of the um the players here is a uh, uh, uh Coroibus. And he it's his idea. He uh Lombardo's translation he says, let's follow fortune's lead and exchange our armor for Donon gear. Who cares? Is if this is deceit or valor? So isn't it fascinating that he even asked that question? In, right. So he's almost kind of giving away that he's. So Virgil's saying, trying to put his his finger on it for us in case we missed it. Exactly right. But it's so, not heavy handed. No, but it's almost like the he the, the guy himself is pausing and saying like ordinarily we wouldn't do this. Right. But it's so desperate. Who cares? Right. Right. And he says the enemy will supply us with weapons, and so they start they disguise themselves as Greeks, and what they quickly find is that other Trojans see them. And of course, what do they do? They start friendly, shooting arrows at friendly them. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. Yeah, it's not going to work. It's terrible. Mm. Yep. And so the whole thing backfires. Uh, many of them are killed by their fellow Trojans. Um, Coroibus, he himself ends up being killed. Um, and I thought this was just an interesting detail that Aeneas notes that another one of his friends here, comrades here, Panthus, is killed. And he, uh, Aeneas notes that even his piety did not save him. Mm. Uh, and he notes that he was wearing a, a fillet of Apollo. And, right. And Apollo so a fillet is a, is a, I'm sorry to interrupt, but yeah. a fillet for our audience is a fancy headband. Fancy headband, right. You don't wear it to the tennis court. It's something that you wear to a sacrifice to or sacrifice. a ritual. You're right. And it's a, like, it's a, it's a mark or an indicator that says, don't shoot. I'm, right. I'm sacred. Exactly. Exactly. And that didn't, that didn't, uh, but I thought that was an interesting detail that, you know, Aeneas here, Pius Aeneas, right. notes that one of his, his, comrades that the, who apparently was marked by piety himself it did not save him in this yeah. moment yeah and then we come to the uh the rape of cassandra mm-hmm. a horrible horrible 
uh, episode or incident in this uh, in this epic. Right. Deeply disturbing. Yes. Yeah, so um, the, the Greeks are kind of making their way up the, the levels of the city. And mm. the way I always imagine it. Do you, um, uh, Tolkien guy? Are you yes, Tolkien that's guy? right. So it reminds well, I me. I know I'm not a Tolkien you know, guy. But do you know. Because I don't like all the association. The associate. What? What, what is this? Uh, anything. Anytime anything becomes too popular, I don't want to be associated. Oh, I got with you. It. Yeah, I got you. Right. But I do know the books. I've read them multiple times. Right. And, but there's a, a city um, yep. that is besieged and taken called Minas Tirith. That's right. And it's also kind of built in kind of these these layers, these tiers, and the citadel is the very top. Of right. It. And I often kind of picture that kind of thing happening here. In that, Troy. That there are, the Greeks started at the bottom, and they're making mm-hmm. their way up to the citadel, to the temple, to the to the palace. Right. And that's where they find Cassandra. And they uh, they tie her up and drag her away by her hair. Right. Can I read some of the Latin there before yeah. you read uh, the Lombardo translation? Sure. Okay. So this goes: Hel nihil inuitis fas quemquam fidere divis, ecatrahe baturpa sis pria mea virgo, crinibus a templo Cassandra ditis quemenerwai, ad caelum ten deins ad ardentia lumina frustra, lumina nam teneras arcebant vincula palmas. Yes, and, um, it strikes me that isn't um, the first time that we see Aeneas himself in the epic. He's stretching his hands. And That's it, right. It's almost the, it's almost the exact same Latin. You're right. His right? duplicates palmas, his, yeah. his twin palms. But here they are, the tender palms, the tanneras palmas. Yes. And Lombardo translate the, translate this thusly. Never rely on the gods for anything against their will. The next thing we saw was Cassandra, Priam's daughter, being dragged, hair streaming from the shrine of Minerva's temple, lifting to heaven her burning eyes, her eyes only. For her tender hands were bound. Mm. Yeah. Ah, that's a, a brutal scene. And then she's taken back, as we know, she's taken back to Mycenae where she's killed by Clytemnestra. Yeah. An yep. innocent person mistreated by the horrors of war. And not only that, it's even worse. She can see it coming and, and because of, of her kind of her cursed gift of prophecy. Yes. She sees it coming and can do absolutely nothing about yeah. it. Yeah. That's a story we'll have to tell sometime from uh, Ovid, one of the vignettes. Uh, yeah. How she got this prophetic gift from failed romance with yes. Apollo. Yep. Yeah. A lot of a lot of bad things happen when Apollo's a, he was a bad breaker upper. Absolutely. <laughs> Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. So now we come to Hecuba and Priam. Yeah, so Aeneas tells us that uh, women and children are, are are shrieking, they're freaking out. They're taking refuge up in the in the temple of Minerva. Um, and uh, in Lombardo's translation, Aeneas says, I saw Hecuba with her hundred daughters, and Priam polluting with his blood the very altars he had con- consecrated himself, which I thought was an interesting detail. And remember last time we were talking about right. this idea of kind of this twisting of re- re- this reversal of, of religious um, meaning and, right. and, and meaning of sacrifice. Yeah, the perversion of the ritual. The perversion of the ritual. And so this idea that Priam, again, completely innocent, you know, he's a victim here, um, polluting with his own blood. He's, cre- he's he's performing a kind of sacrilege, but not out of any kind of malice. No. Um, but he's, he's polluting the, the altar of Minerva with his own blood, and and uh, and it's almost like he's setting himself. A, it's a it's a prelude to his own um, you know sacrifice at the altar. Right. Yeah. It's 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 brutal. Um, and then we go on to the the sociopathy of Pyrrhus or Neoptolemus. Yeah, I thought this was really interesting. Is that. Um, so Achilles has a son, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but he does not, so he, um, uh, Virgil calls him Pyrrhus uh, or Neoptolemus, right. uh, same guy. He does not figure in the Iliad, right? Do, do we even hear about no, Achilles' I don't believe, son? No, I don't believe so. So he's, he's, uh, he's kind of a, a newish character on the scene, not that you know, Virgil invents him. No, he's part of the epic tradition, he's not right. part of the Iliad, to my knowledge. I also was kind of shocked because I, I thought when I first read this, and maybe other readers have this experience, that Achilles was a youngish man. Yeah. Right, that Achilles was maybe 25, 26. Yeah. So how could he have a full-grown son who's involved in battle? Right. And, you know, most of the Hollywood portrayals, Achilles is a younger man. But in order for the timeline to work, now here you're going to say, that's not a question you're supposed to ask. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm not going to play my own game here. Right. I'm going to break the rules. He'd have to be in his mid-30s in order for, or later for Neoptolemus to be old enough to be involved in battle. At least, right. I think it's one of those details that, I'm sure, sure, you know, Homer was aware of, but he ignores mm-hmm. um, the same the idea with kind of the business of Achilles and his heel. Homer never mentions that. No, um, but yeah, it's it is it just kind of it does kind of pause to say, well, wait, you know, how old was he when he how got could that there? Work? Right, you know, did he? Um, you know, it was Neoptolemus brought over when he was a kid, and he kind of grew up at Troy. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's hard to it is it's hard to square. But he's not in the tent, you know, in the famous scene in no. Book Nine of the Iliad. He's nowhere to be found. No, he's nowhere. Yeah, exactly. You would think if he were Achilles' son, he'd be around there somewhere, right. carrying firewood or 
roasting marshmallows or something. Yeah, exactly. But I thought this was fascinating that, I mean, he's a, he's a psychopath uh, in this scene. Would you say that he's the embodiment of all the worst aspects of his father? Yes. I mean, he, I think, and I thought this was, was, was fascinating that he's, he kind of embe- he embodies that main in the rage, right? right? Um, that Achilles, um, that you know, kind of forms Achilles um, in the in the Iliad. But I thought this was very interesting that you know Achilles' rage, as horrific as it was, there was a reason for it, right? He went after Hector because Hector killed Patroclus. That's right. Hector he- killed an innocent child. Yes. In uh, Achilles' eyes. In Achilles' eyes, right? So there was there was kind of a locus for his rage. Mm-hmm. And as Priam even tries to remind Pyrrhus in the moment, he says, "Listen, you're, even your father set aside his. Even your father gave Hector's body back, right?" Yeah. The famous scene in uh, book what is it? Uh, I don't know. Twenty two, twenty three. Yeah. The ransom of Hector in the tent of Achilles. Right, it's where we see Achilles become human again. Correct. And Priam's trying to re- remind him of this, is, and and um, Pyrrhus is just, nope, you're a dead man. Right. And I thought this was so fascinating that he's an embodiment of kind of the worst of his father's rage, but it has no. Priam, why is he going after Priam? Is it just simply it, it's bloodlust, right? Yeah. It, 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 I mean, the it's also a kind of a prize idea, you know, to kill the king of the whole enterprise. Yes, but to do it in a temple at an altar. I mean, there's all uh, kinds an old of, man. What an, kind of glory is there in killing a helpless opponent on the altar? Right. There's there's no glory. I think that in this, and I think that even um, you know maybe even Achilles at the height of his rage would even have recognized that this is a this is a a bridge too far. Now, Jeff, when you teach this epic, how do your students usually react? Do they, do they ever say, oh, this just glorifies violence? I had that when I teach the Iliad, um, uh, particularly when I ask my students, you know, have you read this before? You know, some of them will read pieces of it in like, you know, ninth grade or, or, or um, more often they're, they're familiar with, the, with movie portrayals. And it's often, it's kind of usually my male students who will kind of look at this as kind of, uh, yeah, the, kind of the, the war is war is cool, right? The kind of the, the clash of swords and, and spears, right. it, it, it's kind of as an element of... They start making lightsaber sounds. R- exactly right. So they, they like kind of the heroism of it, but yeah. often kind of their, what is, what is, you know, where does that go? Um, what do you mean by the heroism? What do you mean by, by courage? It's often very, very shallow. Okay. And so, you know, they'll often take their takeaway from the Iliad is that's kind of a glorification of war. Right. And it's one but of what, my, do, what do you think about that? One of the goals of the teachers is to, is, is to show them that it's in it's really quite the opposite of okay. that. It, it's the it's the futility of right. war. It's it's like in Achilles case, it's the ability of war to turn a man into a monster. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think that's all on the page here. Yeah, so the man into the monster is Neoptolemus. And Neoptolemus, right. Yep. And and he and he does not we do not see him set aside the monster and regain his humanity like his dad did. And this this scene which I would I would vote for um, certainly the most chilling scene in this book. Perhaps the most chilling scene in the whole epic is where um, you know, Priam, who uh, first uh, uh, Pyramus spears one of Priam's children right in front of him. Right. And Priam. So that one goes down. Now, goes, now Priam is standing in a in blood. He's standing in blood. He's at the he's at the altar. He's kind of pathetically in his in his old armor. Right. Um, this is just trophy armor that was hung in the halls, never meant to be used. Right. It just kind of adds to kind of the the, the oddity, the pathos uh, right. to it. And he, uh, Priam, in that moment, you know, he she tries to remind Pyrrhus, you know, even mm. your even your dad set aside his rage, even your dad gave, you know, Hector's body back to me, and um, and then what Pyrrhus says to him is that just before he kills him in Lombardo's translation, he says, uh, "Well, then you can take this news to my father, you know, in the underworld, right? Right, says, the son of uh, the son of Peleus. Be sure to tell him about my sad behavior and how degenerate his son has become. Now die." And so saying, he dragged Priam, trembling and slipping in his son's blood, up to the altar, winding his left hand in the old man's hair. With his right, he lifted his flashing sword and buried it up to its hilt in his side. Yeah, in Priam's side. In Priam's side. Yeah. I mean, those those lines there, uh, the, the dripping, dark sarcasm. You just, oh, you make sure when you see my dad, tell him how, uh, how bad of a boy I've become. Yeah. I, desperate. Uh, it's desperate. It's It's horrific, right? And if we think about even that scene in Book Eleven of the Odyssey, where Odysseus meets the ghost of Achilles, right? Achilles, um, um, he has a very different message. A very different message. Yeah, don't right? don't throw everything into war. No, it's better to serve above than be a king down here. Down here, right? Life so, is worth living, even in a in a very limited and uh, captive state. Right. And Not so, Pyrrhus's attitude. Exactly right. And so you you have to think that Virgil's original audience would have known Odyssey Book Eleven very very well. And maybe even Virgil intends for them to think about that um, Neoptolemus 
doesn't understand his own father mm. at all. Mm. Right. Should we read a little bit of that Latin? Yeah. Would you do that for us? Yeah, I'd yeah. love to do yeah. that. Qui perderus referes er gaicet nuntius ibis, peli dai genator reali mea tristia facta, de genardrem quene optalamum nardrardrem memento, nunc more rock di canes altariad ipsa trementem, troxitet in multo lapsantem sanguinanati. There's that, that part there, right? Yeah. Lapsantem sanguinanati, having slipped in the blood of his son. Yeah. Implica wit quecomam laiwa dextri quecordruscum. Ex tulit ac lateri capolo tennis abdidit ensem. Yeah. Yeah, buried the sword, abdidit ensem. Right. And never forgetting that this is taking place not on the battlefield, but at the altar of Minerva. Yeah. Right? Again, again, a perverted sacrifice. Well, it's like the scene in, uh, is it the second Godfather, where there's the murder at the, uh, that's going on while they're showing the mass? I, I think that's the first. Is that's, that the that's first, first one? Yes, exactly. The, switching back and forth between the two perspectives. The, yeah. the family is celebrating Mass in, yeah. in the cathedral in the church. You've seen The Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen all three. All three. Oh, I'm sorry about the third one. Yeah, but, so is everyone else. But um, you, that's a great corollary. That's a brilliant mm. scene. Yeah. 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 But it doesn't take place there, but you get to see the two things juxtaposed. juxtaposed. Right? Yeah. So Pyrrhus is what his father would have been if he had survived. Well, I, you know, I don't know. It's, I, I think we're supposed to see that you know, Pyrrhus is a is a, a extremely unworthy heir to his father's um, his father's heroism, such as it was. You know, Achilles mm. set aside his monstrousness, at least in that moment. Mm. Um, Pyrrhus has not learned, and maybe never will learn mm. what that exactly that means. So at this moment of profundity and high pathos, mm. should we engage in some crass commercialism? Oh, what did you have in mind? What do you what are you interrupting this for? Well, because Jeff, yeah? I just read some Latin and maybe some of our audience would like to learn how to do that too. Oh, of course, right. You're talking about LPSI. Yes, I am. Oh, yeah. Lingua Latina Per Se Illustrata. Tell they us need, about it. Well, they need to go to, well, you changed your tune quickly. <laughs> <laughs> they need to go to latinperdm.com and check out a lot of my free instruction, uh, latinperdm.com slash LLPSI, and you can sign up for my course, $199. It goes ab initio, I'd like to say, from the ground up, mm -hmm. and uh, you can gain real skill in reading Latin. Eventually, you can learn how to scan poetry. You can come to our, uh, our weekly office hours, and I can teach you how to scan the very first day if you're up for it. Scanning on the first day. Sure, I can teach that. Fantastic. In an hour's time, you could learn to do it. It's really not difficult. Yeah, excellent. Check it out. All right. So we got to wrap up here pretty soon, we Jeff. Do. But where are we headed as we wind down? Well, Aeneas himself is, you know, he's hes watching, he's seeing all of this. And um, you know, despite what the ghost of Hector has told him, he still seems really frozen. Yeah. Right? I, I think that's the idea that... The ghost that, of Hector appeared to him bedraggled, right? Yes. And, and Aeneas at that point didn't know Hector was dead. Oh, that's right. That's right. Exactly. This is the first indication. I, his beard was clotted with blood because he'd been dragged around the city and all of that. Yeah. I uh, didn't know he was dead. And um, and he tells him, I think it's the first time that Aeneas hears that, mm -hmm. um, you, he, and Hector says, you need to get out of here. You, God is born. Quit the city. Quit the city. You, you've got new walls to build somewhere right. else. But he still seems, he doesn't know what to do. You know, even that scene that, uh, you know, the, the Sklenar article too is that, you know, what is Aeneas doing? He's watching this. He watches this this murder of Priam, why is he just standing yeah. there? Right? Well, it's the definition of a nightmare, right? You must have had those dreams, nightmares, where you're trying to run or something, sure. and your legs won't move. You have some urgent thing to do, but you don't know what it is. Yeah, exactly. I right. have this experience. Exactly. While there are kind of swans juggling pickles in the periphery, <laughs> and, uh, right? Uh, all kinds of other Mine objects. are not usually quite that absurd, but there's some pressing thing I have to do and I'm physically incapable of doing it. I know that dream. Overcome with some kind of torpor. Right. Yeah. So and yes, I use words like torpor, torpor. In, in my dreams. <laughs> <laughs> this is what Aeneas is experiencing. So he, he's just simply frozen by the horror of it. Right. Yeah. 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 No, I, 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 I think that's, I think that's a, an astute reading of this, but he's still, he's um, beyond that scene. He's torn. Do I stay and and fight and likely die in some kind of you know heroic but um, um, failed mm -hmm. last stand? Right. Or do I cut and run? I think he's he's um, he's trying to you know what? Where's the where's the valor in this? Where's the piety in this? Right. What's my action here? Right. And the, I think there are two major episodes remaining that we're going to have to get to in the next episode of the podcast. Okay. And the last two episodes are the encounter with Helen. Yes. And then Creusa, who gets lost in the shuffle. And she also appears to him in a dream. Right. 
right. and there's some deep pathos there, of course. Yes, and I'd also like to cover this fascinating um, passage where his Venus, his mom, shows up again. Yes, and kind of lifts the veil from his eyes and kind of shows him, you know, encouraging him to leave. Says, "Look, these are what the gods are doing right now right. that you can't even see." To kind of show him how desperate and hopeless this is. Mm. Yeah, mm. it's like uh, it's like Hebrew uh, scriptures in some ways where people's eyes are open to see what's really going on. You know, the, the horses and chariots of Israel are marching through the treetops. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it's in, uh, I don't know, First Chronicles. But, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. It's like that. Yeah. You know, there's a, a, a spiritual world that's going on, and you can't see it, but if your eyes are opened, suddenly you realize this is it. Yes, but that will have to wait until... until yes, all we're, right. We're up against it. All right, so um, before we get out of here, though, Dave, yeah. would you tell us something about the Moss Method? What? More crass commercialism? More crass I craven. Thought this, I thought this was about uh, the literary life, not filthy lucre. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of lucre along the way. Not, there's nothing wrong with that. I love to say the word lucre because it's so ridiculously spelled. L-U-C-R-E? Yeah, it's like B- Brett Favre. 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 Yeah, yeah. some <laughs> filthy lucre. <laughs> You too can play for the Minneapolis, uh, the Minnesota Vikings. Vikings, yes. Because that's where he ended up, you know. He did, he did, but he was most famous as a Packer. That's correct. Yes, yes. Speaking of Packers, if you want to study Greek, <laughs> you need to go to mossmethod.com, check out all my free instruction, and sign up for the course. We've got some good response lately, people signing up, coming to the office hours on Friday. I take them from, what do I take them from? Neoprene? No, it's from a neophyte. Uh, to uh, what? Creosote? Uh, erudite. Erudite. Yes. All right. All right. So it's it's neophyte to erudite. Yes. Okay. It costs $325. Mm-hmm. Can you tell them about the office hours? This seems to be your favorite part. This is where on Friday... Where you send in some just some generic flunky, flanky, to, flanky to talk to the wait no there's no flanky there's no flanky no flanky no no you're you're there I gotta go myself Dave is there okay and he's hosting the office hours on, on Friday where people do from, I hold forth you hold forth and you but you get to meet people from around the world that's right reading Greek together it's, yes it's a it's a wonderful thing how come you haven't joined us yet Jeff nobody's invited me maybe I should send you the Zoom link and just think how this class would explode could I pop in kind of bomb the, yeah, you the could. office hours photo bomb <laughs> the office hours because <laughs> people to... are thinking yeah Noe but I want to interact with the Winkle yeah I can, I can understand he's the this. funny one that's right. That's right. So if they go to mossmethod.com, they can find all this stuff. That's right. They can sign up for the course. Excellent. All right. Who who do we got to thank? Well, uh, we need to thank Mishka, our sound engineer, who puts this together so nicely. She's having a little bit of uh, tech issues this week, but she's going to get through them. Okay. And then she's going to put together a lovely podcast. She always does such a nice job. Yes, she does. We need to thank uh, Scott Van Zen, who's Mm -hmm. a, a cross between... Uh, Eddie Van Halen and Stevie Ray Vaughan, guy can play the blues. Yeah, like yeah. no other, that guy's, that guy's amazing. Yes, gives us uh, all this music. And Ken Tamplin uh, of the famous Vocal Academy, who gives us the bumper music and composed, I think, all the music that appears on the podcast. And he gives us the gurgle music, too. That's great. And yeah. do yourself a favor. Check out his vocal reactions. Yeah, they're to, funny, to, aren't they? Uh, to various vocals. He's, he's, so, he's so witty. Yeah. And he knows what he's talking he about. He absolutely does. Yeah. Five octave range. Yeah. Incredible amazing. singing. Yeah. All right, so hey, um, if you want to get a shout out like Mr. Rodney Croom got on the top of this uh, of this episode, you should drop us a note. Yes, right to Dave at Dave at ad Don't forget the V or Jeff at ad There's a V in ad nauseum too, and uh, you know, tell Jeff what you like about him, and uh, you know, how does he put up with me, and you know. You love the show, you love his contributions, do that kind of thing. And Rodney, in his email, he gave us a suggestion of, of some things that he would like to hear on the show. Oh, you're just mentioning that because it was about your dissertation. Well, that was, well, now that you break it up. <laughs> this thing from your mind. Right. But we love that kind of stuff. That's we want, right. We want to hear what you're interested in, and we're always, uh, we always love ideas for, for, for new shows. Yeah, you yep. could go to the website, ad nauseum.com. You could pick up a Kwai No Kent Do Kent t-shirt or some other paraphernalia. Very stylish, comes in different colors and um, whatever size you need and where are we going next week with episode 87 well we're going to finish up book two i promise we're going to finish up oh, book two. i don't know and we've made a lot of crazy promises i know and maybe even make some strides into book three would three? it be would it i be? think i think that follows two yes two uh we'll finish up two and we'll get into three yep mm-hmm. and it, we're probably going to interrupt this uh aeneid uh you know, this travel through the Aeneid at some point, aren't we? And do some other things. Yeah. We'll keep the people listening. Exactly. We, you don't want to suffer from Virgil fatigue. No, I no. can't imagine such a thing. But a, if it were a, to happen. A case of VF. Yes. And Jeff, I believe you have the gustatory parting shot to take us out. Yes. This comes from Justin Swap in his um, his book, The Shadow Servant. 
He writes, you never cook, you never cook onions with your beans. That's a recipe for tear gas. <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.